All right, to say that this has escalated quickly, I just don't think would really sum it up exactly. I either pull the radiator condenser grill bull bar and bring the cam out the front of the motor and hope that the cam bearings aren't worn, or I pull the whole motor out. And I still haven't decided. Hey guys, welcome back to Aussie Arvos. Been getting a lot of questions about where I've been for the last little bit. Uh, it has been a hot minute since I've been on a video. The answer to that question is, Camping in cars, braking cars, fixing cars, repeat. So today I'm going to run you through the last little mission on the patrol. Uh, this has been going on for, well, the lead up to it's been going on for since I bought the car. But the actual repairs taken me probably about a month to uh, get through everything. Been a bit of a job, but um, hopefully this video helps anyone that's looking at doing it in the future. So, what was the problem? Well, for a start, for anyone that hasn't followed along, this car is a TB42, so 4.2 petrol, carby, Auto, that's a 89 GQ. They're a cast iron block, aluminium head, which in my mind is just an immediate head gasket problem. Um, if you know anything about metallurgy and the way things move differently. So this car has done, it's just about to tick 400,000 Ks. And ever since I got it, it's been having this issue. The hardest part about it was, I almost wish it was a head gasket problem where you started the car and it blew all the coolant out straight away. And I knew what the problem was. But what it was doing is you could drive it around town, drive it through the bush as hard as you wanted, get on the highway and sit for about two, three hours on a hundred. It'd eventually overflow the radiator into the overflow bottle which would fill up and then out the drain hose and you'd end up losing about two, three litres of coolant out of the radiator, at which point the temp would start to creep up because there's less coolant in the radiator and then you'd have to pull over and take the cap off and make a massive mess everywhere and put hot, cold water in a hot motor like you really shouldn't be. And It's gonna love that, just a bunch of cold, cold, <laughs> hot, hot energy. Yeah, that's not good, Dan. Yeah. Not ideal. So I chased every other thing that I thought I could be. I thought it might have been the gas converter. They have a cooling jacket, so I thought it might have been leaking high pressure LPG into the cooling system. Wasn't that. Checked over everything else, made sure the fan hub was working. And eventually I put a head gasket, you can get a chemical head gasket check basically that you put on the radiator, run the car, and if there's any products of combustion coming out of, as a gas coming out of the radiator, it changes colour. It's a chemical that changes colour. Well, that didn't show anything up. I ran it for about half an hour on about two grand. Nothing, nothing coming up. So it was only under load. And eventually I sort of had to bite the bullet and go, I really hope it is a head gasket and take the whole thing apart. All right, let's make a start. So first step's gonna to be to drain the coolant. Next step is gonna be remove all this air intake system. Right, oh, so I've stripped off carby, all the intakes off. And I started stripping off the intake manifold. On the other side, uh, obviously dizzy caps off taken off the exhaust manifold heat shield. As with all things on exhaust, especially manifolds, they were horribly seized. So I managed to get three out of four, which I count as a success. Other than that, I did notice as I'd taken all the heat shielding and everything else out of the way, I had a slight vibration, engine vibration in the car, and I thought it might've been engine mounts, but I hadn't really had time to look into it yet. Then I got here, and I don't know about the condition of the engine mount itself, but um, that, uh, that's meant to be done up, I think. So we might look into that as well. Next is exhaust manifold, unbolt. This is your best friend. WD-40 the hell out of everything on there. And then intake manifold off, same deal. I've been cracking all the bolts by hand. You can use a gun to run them off, but I'd use a ratchet or a socket or a spanner to undo them to start with, just because they're into an alloy head. Um, alloy tends to want to grab and you will get them undone with a gun, but there's a chance you might rip the thread out with it, which makes your day a lot harder. So we try and avoid that. I'll start stripping these off, then the intake manifold off, and we'll keep going. All right, so as you can see, everything's off, out of the way to get this head off. From here on, back off each one of the adjusters on the rocker arms, which gives you free play and all of them. Then we're gonna take the rocker shaft off. We're gonna start at the outside at each end and step in in stages, end to end, until we get to the center. Take the whole rocker shaft off, and then from there, there's three rows of head bolts, and we'll do them next. All right, so I've got the rocker shaft, all the rocker arms stripped off the head, ready to take the head off. Now there's basically four rows of, or four columns, four rows of bolts on these, whatever you want to call them. So you want to start at the front and the rear, and basically the same as you would in torquing a head up, you're going to cross back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, till you get to the center. 
it's not so much of an issue if you're going to get the head remachined anyway, as I have, but it's good practice. Plus it helps you memorise it for when you're putting it back together. So we'll get this off and see if we can spot the problem. All right, and that's one TB42 minus a head. It's sitting over here. Just going to clean that up and see what sort of warpage it actually has through it. I was lucky that when I did, I found where on the head gasket, uh, which we'll put some pictures up, um, it, it was having an issue right at the back of number six. Now uh, the cause of that, I, I'm assuming, or I wouldn't say assuming, I'm almost certain the cause of that was this had an aftermarket head on it. It had a Chinese reproduction head that was cast in 2012, which considering since that would have been put on, the car was probably done under 20,000 Ks, really says something. So what I've gone ahead and done is got a genuine uh, Nissan head that was off another car. I've, I've sort of scavenged a lot of parts off, thanks to me mate Pete for all of those. Had that machined, valve seats, valve guides, all done. So it's essentially reconditioned genuine head and I put that back on. But uh, it took off as a bit of a mission. And uh, as you'll see in the videos, it um, became a bit more work than I was originally planning to do. All right, so we're nearly ready to put the new cylinder head back on. We're probably up to the most important part of the whole job now, making sure we get that block deck dead clean, dead smooth, and prep to put the gasket and head on. Take your time when you get to this part. Don't rush. If you rush, you'll end up doing the whole job over again. So I'm gonna show you how I prep blocks to put a head, head back on. Um, this only applies to cast iron blocks. I'll show you the differences if you're gonna do something with an aluminium block. Keep in mind there's heaps of different ways to do this. So this is how I do it. It's always worked for me. So everyone's got a different way of doing this sort of thing. So yeah, this is just my way and I've never had issues with it. So I'll go through that now. Okay, so time to prep the deck for the new cylinder head. I generally start with a razor blade. Use that to take off any of the existing gasket that's still stuck. Um, luckily for me, this one come off pretty clean anyway because the head was loose, hence why it was leaking. So none of the gasket was really stuck, but when they've been on there for 30 years, they can be hard to come off. Uh, I blocked up the lifter holes with rag as best I could to stop anything falling down them. These holes along the edge here are the water jacket. These are obviously your head bolts, water jacket, water jacket. Uh, more head bolts. So you try not to put anything into there. Um, it's not the end of the world if a little bit does fall in the water jacket. I'm going to flush the radiator after I put the head back on after maybe 100 k's anyway, which I'd recommend doing for that reason. Um, try not to get anything in the head bolt holes. I'm going to clean them out before I put the head on anyway. Cylinders, some people stuff them with rags, but to be honest, when you take the rag out, anything that's sitting on the rag generally falls in anyway. So I generally leave them clean, blow out anything that does end up in there before we put the head back on. As far as this goes, I generally just scrape the gasket away from the cylinders. So obviously you're not pushing things into the cylinders as best you can. You know, you start at the inner edge and work your way off. Now, as I was saying before about the difference between aluminium and cast blocks, um, this being cast iron, no problems using a razor blade. Uh, if you are going to use a razor blade on aluminium, you've got to be very, very, very cautious. The main issue you have if you do an aluminium is as soon as you dig in a corner, you'll end up gouging the block and then it's very hard to fix once you've done that um, without getting it machined. So again, if you're going to do that on an alloy block, be very careful or just don't use it at all. So then I usually go over the whole deck surface with this, which is red Scotch-Brite. Um, if it's an aluminium block, you don't want to use this. You want green Scotch-Brite, like a kitchen scourer. That's plastic. This is uh, metal oxide, so it will gouge aluminium. But on a cast iron block like this, you won't have any problems. Use it to take off any of the existing gasket that you missed with the razor blade or you couldn't get off with the razor blade. Uh, sometimes helps to soak it in a bit of brake clean or gun wash, thinners, anything like that will help clean it up. Then from there we move on to the sharpening stone. Now if you don't already have a sharpening stone kicking around in your shed somewhere, you should be able to pick one up from any sort of local hardware shop. They're pretty basic. If you are using an old one, make sure it's level. Basically you want to take the rough surface of that, cover it in oil, and you're going to put it level on the block. And then you're going to run that over the entire deck surface in a circular motion, like you were polishing a car, round and round, slowly, the whole way over the surface. That's probably the most time consuming part of the whole job. Now what that does is not only does it clean the surface, give you a nice smooth surface, but it also will pick up any low spots. So if there's any low spots on this deck surface, uh, as you're keeping that level, it will, it will show sort of a dull spot where it's not cleaning and you'll be able to tell. You can either keep going over that spot. If it's very slight, it might pick it up, smooth it out. If it's obviously anything too horrible or too low, you'll check it with a straight edge and may have to get your deck surface machined. But um, yeah, that's a good way to check all that and it also gives you a nice surface. Now the last step is to take a bit of fine sandpaper or wet and dry sandpaper, nothing too fine. That's 800 grit. I'll lay that over that stone, obviously knowing that that's level. 
fair bit of oil on that and we'll go over the whole surface in that in the same motion and what that does is basically roughs up this it's pretty much dead smooth now roughs it up ever so slightly um, I'm not talking using 80 grit or anything crazy like that but a nice fine grit we'll take off any sort of last little burrs and smooth that up nicely and uh, then we're ready to clean and lay the gasket and head on all right to say that this has escalated quickly I just don't think would really sum it up exactly uh, so after getting the deck and everything ready to put the head back on I thought I'll just quickly check the lifters which was a mistake I think um, that that is not how that's meant to look um, which is fine if it was just lifters the worst part is that that being in the state it is has also chewed the nose off a couple of well a couple of them are like that so it's chewed a couple of lobes off the cam which means cam's got to come out which means I either pull the radiator condenser grill bull bar and bring the cam out the front of the motor and hope that the cam bearings aren't worn or I pull the whole motor out and I still haven't decided I think I'm gonna take the timing cover off, um, obviously water pump and all that, distributor, all that off, to get to the cam, check if there's any free play in it before I start, and then pull the cam out, and hopefully it's not too bad uh, bearing-wise. So yeah, things are going well. All right, so with that, the simple job of put the head back on has become a bit of a mission. I've made the decision to take the cam out and see how bad it is, if it's worn the cam bearings or not. I haven't got to that stage yet. Deck's covered up to keep that clean, keep everything out of the cylinders. Aircon compressor off, power steering pump off, dizzy out, alternator off, auto cooler, radiator, aircon condenser, which means I'll have to get the gas sucked out of that, balancer off, timing cover off cam out through the front of the car, which is why the condenser's got to come out, and then see how the cam bearings are. And all that being in a good state, uh, we're off to Crow to get the cam re-machined, re-ground. Um, look, I'm not going to go too crazy with it, but why would you put a stock cam back in? So that might get a bit of a tweak while we're here, and put it all back together. So yeah, it's become a bit more of a considerable mission than I originally planned it to be, but I guess at um, just about 400,000 Ks, it's not too bad. So. We'll continue on and I'll keep us posted. Alright, so that is the cam out of the block, as you can see. Now, why did I take it out? There's your issue right there. So as those lifters have chewed, they've taken a fair bit off the nose of the cam lobe there. And that one too. The rest seem to be in relatively good nick. Those two are the most damaged ones. Um, I've had that a quick measure up. It's taken about 0.2 of a mil off, so I'm going to talk to the guys at Crow and see just what sort of what sort of tolerance there is for what they can take off these. Sometimes they can machine a bit off the base circle, end up with enough on the nose to still give you the lift you want. So we'll talk to the experts on that one. But uh, everything here is ready to be left for the night. I'm going to measure up these cam bearings in the morning. Um, but at a quick look, they don't look too worn at all, so that's good news because that was what I was most worried about. Other than that, clean all the sealer back off and uh, get the cam machined and we're ready to go again. Alright, so to every negative there is a positive and the negative of the cam being wrecked is that I got to put a new cam in. Now, if you're going to put a new cam in a motor, this might just be me, but why would you put a factory one back in? There's so many better options out there. So this has now got a Crow Cam's high torque cam in it. Um, the grind number is a 442867 from memory, uh, which is basically a little bit more lift than factory and slightly different uh, duration. They reckon it'll pull better around the two grand to four grand mark rather than everything from factories about around the four grand. So they reckon same horsepower up high, but more torque down low, which I've definitely noticed. It pulls, pulls up the same hill at the same speed, but at about two grand, where it would have done it at three or four before. So using less throttle, which I think will be good, especially uh, on the highway. Doing 100 in overdrive, this sits at around 1,800, two grand, so it should be spot on. All right, so as you can see, the cam is back in, and I've got it all timed up. Now, I didn't get a chance to film this whole process, but I'll walk through some of the basics of it for you. For a start, put the cam in. I used a long bit of tube on a bolt so not the factory bolt because you're going to reuse that but just a longer bolt fits that thread and jammed a bit of tube over it which helps you use it as a lever you don't want to just jam the cam in against the bearings you want to gently slide it between the bearings so you don't damage them on the way in after that it's a matter of putting fitting up the 
cam sprocket and the crank sprocket for the timing chain. Now this is probably the most important part of this entire process because if you get this wrong, you're gonna cost yourself a fair bit of money, especially when you've just had a head done like I have. There's two marks on the two sprockets, that little dot right there. The bottom one is harder to see, especially now that I've put a, another sprocket in front of it. Actually, if I get my spare crank sprocket, that notch lines up with, the notch and the dot line up with two bright colored links or shinier links. You can see that one, they're a bit dirtier after it's done 400,000 Ks, but on the new chain there, you can see that's a shiny link. And there's the same on the bottom lining up with that other notch I just showed you. They should be directly above it. So as you can see, that's centered on the dot. The other one's centered on the dot. You do this with the motor at top dead center. The crank and the cam both have keys on them, which should be very close to 12 o'clock. So you put the chain on the sprockets, then slide both sprockets on at the same time. There's no joining link. It's a factory press chain, so you can't put them on afterwards you have to put them on together then fit up this tensioner then come the oil pump slash fuel pump uh, sprocket and the crank sprocket for that they don't have to have any particular alignment it's just a drive there is no alignment between those two so uh, basically put them on as you took them off they're simple this is the top guide which you obviously bolt on with the tensioner there and then slide those two on make sure none of these keys fall out as you put it together as well and then that's your tensioner for that which is just a hand tensioner uh, it's not not like the other one is an oil assisted spring tensioner this is just tensioned when you put it together and then i put a bit of oil on all these surfaces you don't have to do that either but it's just nicer when it first cranks up before the oil gets to everything not to have all this dry cam bolt is obviously torque to spec uh, as is the oil pump bolt then from there it's ready to fit the timing cover all right so the timing case is only held on or only sealed on with uh rtv silicon so that's what i'm using there which is an rtv sealer use something decent quality as long as it's oil resistant and temperature rated you'll be fine there so this probably looks like a lot more on camera than it actually is because it always does and someone's going to say i use too much sealer but that's fine because i don't care just a three mil bead around the edge of that, or roughly a three mil bead. I put a bit more around that water jacket because that makes me nervous. So that'll be it. So that seals water, everything else seals oil. Uh, make sure to do this little bit in the center, which is an oil feed for the distributor. And there's a jet that also sprays at the timing gears. So make sure you seal that. And everything's clean, we're ready to bolt it on. Okay, cam retainers, done. Cam bolt, done. Tensioner bolts, done. Tensioner, done. Oil pump tensioner done oil pump guide done oil pump nut done chain guide done keys are all in chains are lined up shiny tooth to shiny tooth ready to go all right so we're ready to put the head on this morning i've dropped the car back down low it's back on blocks of wood again just to get everything easy to lift the head over i've gone over and cleaned all that up again uh we're back to where we were two weeks ago so timing covers on, everything's timed up, head's ready to go on. I've gone over that with some thinners, made sure it's all clean again, blowing the cylinders out, make sure there's nothing in any of them. Same for the head, which is looking just fantastic now it's been rebuilt. So that's all cleaned up with thinners as well. Shiny new gasket just there, ready to put it together. Okay, so my plan was always to change this cylinder head. Uh, I was never gonna reuse the head that was on it just because the way it was leaking in such a minor way, I was concerned there was a crack in the alloy casting itself. Um, hence why I got the head off another car. But if I was gonna change it, I thought I may as well increase the compression a little bit. So these are really low compression from factory. They're like 8.3 to one, which is really really low which is why they they suit being turboed really well i wasn't going to go down that path i don't plan on going down that path so i thought i'd bump the compression up a little bit which basically just involves skimming a bit more off the head so when you get a head machined they just machine the bare minimum off it to make sure the head surface is dead level where it bolts to the block i skimmed about 40 thou or one millimeter off which bumped the compression to about 9.1 to 1 which is still relatively low so it can still run on standard 91 or you know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're getting pretty average fuel, it's not going to start misbehaving. Um, guys running comp truck stuff with these, can you can skim a lot more of them. I've heard 60 thou, 70 thou, um, which will give you like around 10 to 1, 10 and a half to 1, depending on how much you want to take off and how far you want to go. But again, you end up having issues with, with fuel and heat. So the more compression, the more heat, um, which I didn't want. So I wanted to keep it relatively simple. So yeah, got the head machined, um, head fix in Bayswater sorted that for me. So yeah, skim the head, new valve seats, 
new valve guides, so it's essentially brand new. So that, that should be a minor performance increase in itself. All right, head is on, end torque down. Now there's a bit of work in getting this right. Um, basically, you have to wind the bolts up. I'm sure a lot of people don't do it this well, but I've done it by the book. So I've gone up to 29 Newton meters through the whole sequence as a start, then all of them up to 57, then 67, then loosen them all back again and then 29 Newton meters and 74 degrees. So uh, if you've got an old school torque wrench, you can just do up to 29 Newton meters and then you can get a, a dial that'll, that'll give you degrees. I was lucky enough to borrow a mate's digital torque wrench, which has got uh, automatic changeover. So you set it to 29 Newton meters and 74 degrees and it just switches over when it gets to 29 and does the degrees for you, which is, makes life a lot easier, especially when you've got to do 26 head bolts. So yeah, do them all in sequence, start at the centre and work your way out. Uh, if you bought a head gasket, it should come with something like that that's going to give you a, a sequence anyway. But yeah, uh, all new head bolts. I didn't reuse the existing ones. Um, they are torque to yield, so that means they stretch. You shouldn't reuse them. I'm sure some people say you can, but for the sake of the price of a set of bolts, um, I don't think it's worth taking the head off again. So yeah, next up is we'll put the rocker shaft on, rocker arms, push rods in, and loosely set the tappets, rocker cover on, and then I've got a couple of new engine mounts to put in. All right, so the cylinder head is on. Uh, valve train's all set up, valve clearances are done, which I'll run through in a minute. Uh, I've got to readjust them anyway once the motor's running and been hot, so uh, Crow, who did the cam, gave me the spec of 16th hour, which is actually slightly bigger gap than Nissan give you from factory which I'm assuming is because that's a cold clearance, so Nissan give you a hot clearance. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to run it before I've set them, so I've set them to 16th hour for now. We'll run it and then recheck them while it's hot. Yeah, rocker covers on, new gasket on that, uh, new gasket on all the bolts, distributors in, everything's timed, well, roughly timed once again. Once I first crank it, I'll have to set the timing, but, but it's close. Now I'm going to go ahead and put the block drain plug back in and then chuck on the intake and exhaust manifolds and we're one step closer. Okay, just crank it for like a few seconds. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I'll get you to start it. Once it starts, just let it idle, if it will idle, till I yell at you and then bring it up to about two grand. Yeah. So, from there, it's a bit of a leap forward to where we are now. I apologise for not filming more, but there was a lot of late nights involved in getting this thing back together. I work full time, so all this stuff was done a couple of hours here and there during the week. So, it's a bit of a push. And if you're anything like me, when you get in a state of just wanting the car to run again, that's all you can see. So, it's pretty basic from then on anyway. Um, exhaust manifold, intake manifold, all the reverse of removal. So, pretty simple. Uh, radiator and all that back in, coolant back in. Um, I did rebuild the power steering pump while it was off because it was leaking out of the front seal. That was relatively simple, so I did that uh, actually while I was waiting to get a cam ground in the head machined. So there was a few things where I was like, oh, I'm already here. I may as well do this. And that sort of went on for the whole motor. So touch wood, there's not much left in this that I haven't replaced, as in uh, things that wear out. So power steering pump's new, uh, parts of the dizzy are new, high tension lead spark plugs, every coolant hose, like every single one. So there's a bunch that are on the under underside of the intake manifold, which are really hard to get at. There's also these hoses going to the gas converter at the back, which were really rough, like everything LPG installed in the 80s. So I've redone them, wrapped them and tied them up a lot neater, uh, just sort of things like that. So all the hoses, engine mounts, as I mentioned earlier, the radiator was already recode. So if you're gonna do a head, I'd definitely get the radiator done if you haven't already. 
that was already done, so all that's new. I put everything back together and this is kind of my fault. The water pump I'd had checked probably six months ago and it was fine, so that was good. I didn't bother putting a water pump on because it, it would have been convenient to do it while the timing case was off the motor because it's on the front of the timing case. I thought, it's fine, put it back together. And uh, not the first time I ran it, but the second time I ran it, there's this sort of squealing noise. And I'm going, I really hope that's nothing to do with cam chain guides or anything internal, you know, you know as you do. I, I knew it, I almost was certain it wouldn't be, but it's just this thing in your head that what could it be? So I took all the belts off and, and fired it with all the belts taken off and it was smooth as, so right, it's good, it's not internal. Then I spun the fan and the water pump's sort of making this high-pitched squeak, sounds like a bearing. Now, why I say that's my fault is uh, while the timing case was off, I degreased and pressure washed it because it had had a weep out of the bottom of the distributor mount for a long time, so there was a lot of caked on oil all over the front of it, which just annoys me. And I wanted it to be nice, shiny, clean aluminium, uh, so I pressure washed it and degreased it, which I'm fairly certain would have got into the front bearing in the water pump and is what's making it make that noise. So I had to take that off and replace it after the fact. So probably should have done that when I had it all apart, but these are the things you learn. Uh, as I said, yeah, so everything's replaced in here pretty much, so I'm, I'm stoked that I know you, like a lot of the parts I could have just reused and left and they, most of them would have been fine. But everything I do with this car, I want to do properly because I want to be able to take it to Cape York or Fraser or anywhere and not be concerned of, is that hose going to let go? I want to put everything I can into making sure that it's done properly, um, the best that I can, so that I can rely on it to go wherever I want, not be worried about it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's all the add-ons that have happened while I was doing the head. So every hose, every clamp, and uh, yeah, she's a happy thing. So where to go from here? The car's all back together and running, and I have been driving it. It's a little bit out of tune, or it feels like it's a little bit out of tune. So I'll be taking it back to see Eric at Goodies and chuck it on the rollers again. Now, last time you were there, or last time we were there, if you remember, we uh, nailed 63 kilowatts at the wheels. So I'm hoping after all this work, maybe I can push like 63 and a half, 64. Um, <laughs> But no, it's, I mainly want to put it on the rollers just to get it tuned, make sure everything's still happy. It seems like it's running a little bit rich. It's definitely rich when it's on choke, on a cold start. Being that the compression's a bit higher, might want a little bit more timing, but I'm not going to touch anything till I can put it on the rollers, get some actual results and actual measurements. I'm not just hoon tuning it, so. Other than that, uh, before I do dyno tuning, I want to change the air intake setup. So a mate of mine, Cam, has, uh, hooked me up with a GU 4.2 airbox, factory airbox, which will fit in, supposedly fit in the bolt holes that are already in the corner of this, which makes no sense, but it's awesome. Uh, then I'm gonna run steel tube across the top into an uh, intake that'll suit that uh, gas hat. So these filters are terrible. Um, if you have one and you're doing four-wheel driving, get rid of it. I, I mean, I've, I haven't done water crossings or anything with it, obviously, but just sheerly even for dust, I took that apart and it was obvious that a little bit of dust has been leaking past the air filter. They're just flimsy. They're just rubbish, right? That's not a Nissan thing, by the way. That's, that's, uh, that was installed with the gas system. So that's coming off. I'll be putting, yeah, an adapter to suit that into a three or three and a half inch tube that'll run across to an air box mounted in the corner over here, which will work. And then that will also fit up to a snorkel eventually when I get around to that. So all that'll happen before I get it tuned uh, and then tune everything, make sure it's all happy and we'll be good to go. So once everything with the engine sorted, uh, I've got a lot more to do to the car. Uh, next list of mods will be steel bull bar, which is gonna be a bit of fun. I've got a factory ARB non-winch bar, an early one that I'm gonna sort of modify slightly, bit of winch and just a few little minor things that I wanna change on the bull bar, make it sort of my own, not like everyone else's on the road. Stereo, which I've got a lot of a lot of stuff to go in stereo wise. Uh, I want it to be decent, so that should be fun. But I want to do that first, but I just couldn't be the guy that has a loud stereo in a car that overheats every hour. Um, so I thought I'd better take care of the engine first. Eventually snorkel, uh, when I can bring myself to cut a hole in a perfectly good guard, there will be tears, um, but we'll get through it. Uh, and yeah, from then on, it's just, that's sort of my plans for winter, for this winter, uh, and then get back into camping and use it a bit more and see what else we go to from there. Mm -hmm.